So the title of my message today is Four Anchors. I want to speak on the subject of four anchors. I'm not going to preach long, but what that says is four anchors, storm warnings ahead. So I'm going to read in the passage of Acts chapter 27. You can look at it with me on the screen. When it was decided that we should sail to Italy, Paul said, they delivered Paul. I'm sorry, Luke wrote, Paul, Luke wrote the book of Acts and he's talking about the apostle Paul. He said, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion named Julius of the Augustan Regiment. So entering a ship, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. <clears throat> the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends to receive care. So when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. There the centurion, Julius, found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy and he put us on board. That was all the prisoners. Paul was among the prisoners. When we had sailed slowly for many days, we arrived with difficulty. The wind was not permitting us to proceed and we sailed under the shelter of Crete. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens. Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because of the fast, the Day of Atonement was already over, Paul advised them and he said, men, I perceive that this voyage is gonna end with disaster and much lost. Now he didn't say, I prophesy. He said, I'm picking this up in my spirit. He didn't prophesy it. He just said, I'm picking up in my spirit. This is not gonna be a good voyage. I perceive that it's gonna end with disaster and much loss. Not only of the cargo of the ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion who was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southeast and northwest, and then winter there. So this is the setup. Paul's on board as a prisoner. There's 276 people on board. It's a big ship. They had no diesel back in those days. They had no motors. It was a sail. It was a sail, big sail ship. It took a lot of work to tackle that ship. It was the tackling of a ship where you had to have experienced helmsmen, people that's experienced lifting sails, pulling sails down, setting sails partially, setting sails full. They would do it by the wind, the velocity of the wind. When the wind would blow so hard, they'd have to take the sails completely off because it would blow them into the rocks. So the apostle Paul said before they even left shore, I'm picking up something here. He said, I'm picking up that there's going to be disaster and not just the loss of a ship, but the loss of lives. And the Bible said that Julian, Julius had said that he did not believe Paul. That's sort of the way I see things today. There's a storm coming and you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy it. But the thing that sort of grabs me is so many people don't believe it. They don't believe it. They don't want to receive it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want me to talk about it. They don't want other preachers to talk about it. It's like, don't talk about it. Preach something positive and preach something that we need to hear. Well, I'm preaching something you need to hear. Amen. And so the apostle Paul said, I perceive my spirit's picking up on something here. And so with that said, that sets our mind on where we're headed in this story. You may be seated. <clears throat> so the apostle Paul gave a warning. It was a warning about what was going to be we sit here today, there's a lot of sources that people go to when they want to know what's going to be. 
Many people will resort to horoscopes. Many people resort to seeing those in sorceries and dark arts. Many people will talk to other people. What do you think? But Paul was warning about what was going to be. I can't tell you everything today that I sense, but I can tell you that what is coming is going to be vast. It's going to affect not just America, but it's going to affect nations, but it's really going to affect America for sure. It's going to be intense. And it's going to be a dangerous time, just like the Lord told me back December the 19th, 2019. The Lord told me that dark days are coming. He said, extremely perilous times are coming, but tell the people not to worry. So a prophetic warning comes. God usually is faithful to tell people, even though they don't want to hear it, he's usually faithful to tell people even things that they resist hearing. They don't want to hear it, but they hear it. And he wants people to heed it and to prepare. You've got to be prepared. We prepare for everything in life. That's why we carry life insurance. That's why we carry health insurance. That's why we keep our car fixed up. That's why we keep our house repaired. We're preparing for the future. But the second thing that I noticed about this story was, and this is the way it starts out so many times, Sometimes something negative starts out positive, seemingly positive. And it seems like, oh, he missed it. It said, when the south wind blew softly, they supposed that they had made the right decision about setting sail. It said, a south wind blew softly. South wind is a favorable wind. Every mariner knows that, that a south wind is a favorable wind. And they supposed that they had obtained their desire, which means, yeah, we did the right thing by setting sail. Everything's going to be okay. So they put out to sea and they sailed close by Crete. And the reason why they sailed close by Crete was because if anything really went bad, they could still be near the shoreline. But this wind was a misleading wind. A lot of times whenever God gives something and he gives us a warning... A lot of times we find that um, there's also something else going on where it seems like, well, the preacher missed it. Seems like the prophet missed it, whoever the prophet may be. But the very next verse says, the very next verse, show you how fast things can change. I just want to share with you that things can change so fast in your life. Things can change so fast in America. Things can change so fast in your family. Things can change so fast with your health. It says, this is the very next verse, but not long after. See, in verse 13, it said, a south wind blew. Go back to verse 13. A south wind blew softly. Oh, man, this is nice. We did the right thing. But now in verse 14, the very next verse, it says, not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euryclidon, and Euryclidon was the most feared of storms of that day. It would, be, it would be compared to a Category 5 hurricane today, like a Frederick or like a Katrina. Instantly, things deteriorated to the point that if they had not made preparations, there was no time to make preparations. That's exactly what happened when they resisted Paul's word. They at first had a soft wind, Oh, everything's good. They had no radar. They had no weather channel. They had no meteorologist. Paul picked up on it. His radar of the Holy Spirit picked up on it. And he said, there's something coming. And he said, there's going to be loss. So suddenly, everything changed from a soft, favorable wind to a very destructive cyclone. Pow! Suddenly. It was a suddenly. It was not a good suddenly. Suddenly. It was a tempestuous wind. Then the Bible tells us that things became unmanageable quickly. It said, 
in verse 15 and 16, then the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, so we let her go. They were beginning to pull the sails down. If they didn't pull the sails down, that strong wind was gonna take the sails and drive them into the rocks. And they said they let her drive. Running under the shelter of an island, we secured the skiff with difficulty. These experienced mariners, now experienced guys, old rugged seamen, with a lot of experience. Now, they found things so difficult they couldn't manage. They couldn't bear up under this wind. It was a strong wind. It was called Euryclidon. They had to run their sails down the mast. It was propelling them too fast. They had no other means of guidance. I want to just make this clear to everybody. There comes times like this particular story, the Bible is implicit to list every detail of what happened here. It said, they were exceedingly tempest tossed. There was such a wind, such troubled seas. The next day they lightened the ship. They had to start throwing stuff overboard. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. And it said they didn't have the sun or the stars for many days. What that means is the mariners of that day, the only way that they knew how to chart their course was by the stars. Like I said, there was no radar. There was no GPS system. There was no electronics. And they couldn't see the stars. They couldn't see the sun. They couldn't set their sextant. And it had been cloudy for many days. This was a storm that was a slow moving storm. It was in the ocean. It was in the waters where they were. And there's one place in here where it said above 14 days. There was no stars visible and there was no sun visible. No small tempest beat on us and all hope that we should be saved was given up. In other words, quickly, they were at a place quickly Oh, soft wind. Oh, we made the right decision. Next verse, you're reclining. Oh my God. Now, it said they'd given up hope so fast. This was such a storm, such a storm, that they didn't see any way out of it. They had already thrown the tackle overboard. They'd already begun to have some ship damage. Now the Bible said they had given up hope that they would be saved. So the Bible says this, but after a long abstinence from food, Paul had been fasting. Paul stood in the midst of them and he said, men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. If you'd have just listened. And now I urge you to take heart. He said, because there'll be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. We're going to lose the ship. But there stood by me this night an angel, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Look at that. God has granted you, Paul. He was the saving salt on that boat. God was doing this for Paul. He was not doing this for that mariner. He was not doing this for the centurion. He was doing it for Paul. Paul was the salt that seasoned that whole ship with protection. And so it said, take heed men. I believe God that it will be just as he told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors sensed that they were drawing near to some land, and they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they'd gone a little further, they took soundings again and found it would to be 15 fathoms. And then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors. 
from the stern and they prayed for the day to come. I wanna talk about those four anchors for a few minutes. They were in such a storm that this boat did not have engines that could keep the boat from capsizing. They did not have engines that they could stabilize that ship on that stormy sea. It was a big wooden boat that had sails, but the only thing that they had was anchors. And the reason why they threw four anchors was to stabilize the front left, the front right, the rear left, and the rear right dropped four big anchors. These could not be just anchors like you'd have in a 16 or 22 foot boat. These had to be big iron anchors, steel anchors, big ones. Look at that anchor. These had to be four big anchors and it had to have something to grab hold to because I've fished a lot down through the years and I've had anchors on my boat and sometime the wind would blow and I'd put my anchor out but if it was in Louisiana or in the flats of Tallahassee and my boat would be blowing with the wind, that anchor, if it didn't have something to catch on it, just drag along the sandy bottom of the Gulf. Nothing to stop it. But because the Apostle Paul and them were hugging the coast and they were staying as close as they could to Crete, there was all kind of rocky crags. And so when they threw the anchors over, those anchors had to be strong and the attachment, the tethers to those anchors had to be strong to hold that ship because it was a huge ship and there was over 200 people on board. It was a big thing. Had to have big anchors. And I looked at those four anchors and I began to think about these anchors and about the days that are to come in this country in regard to the storm that's brewing the winds were howling. You knew something's coming. So they cast these four anchors. The first anchor that I'd like to talk about when the storm comes and when the storm begins to manifest, the first, the first anchor that you want to throw is the anchor of the immutability of God's word. The immutability, I can't hardly say the word, immutability of God's word. That means it's immutable. The angel told Paul, he said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. Indeed, God has granted all those who sail with you. That was the word that the angel brought to Paul. I want to ask you this question. When the storms come, do you have a word from God about your life? Have you received a word from God about your family? Have you received a word of God about your circumstances. And you might not think too much about that, but has a prophet given you a word? Has God spoke to you through his word? The angel gave a word to Paul in the midst of the greatest circumstances that you can imagine. It's a wonder Paul could even concentrate on what the angel said. But when the angel appeared to him on the boat, other people didn't see that angel. It was a messenger straight to Paul. And he came with the word, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all of those who sail with you. In other words, this boat is gonna fall all to pieces, but you've gotta stand before Caesar. The word is, no matter what conditions are right now, you will survive and you will stand before Caesar. Can I tell you something, friend? You will survive what you're going through and God has already given you a word. Everything is gonna work out for the glory of God. Come on, give God praise. I said give God praise. God has given you a word. And I'm giving you a word this morning also. Don't look at the circumstances. Don't look at the wind. Don't look at the waves. Don't let fear grip your mind. God says you're going to come through this thing. And I declare it in Jesus' name. Somebody give God praise today. Woo. The angel said to Paul, you're going to survive. And then he said, 
And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. These were guys that didn't deserve it. They were prisoners. I want to say this one more time. Paul was on board. God was with Paul. And God was not going to kill everybody on board. He was going to spare them for one reason. There was a man on board that feared God, served God, and loved God. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> and I want to say this to you. I want to say this to you. The tribulation can't begin right now. The false prophet can't be revealed right now. The Antichrist can't be revealed right now. Why? Because you're still on board. We're still here. When the church is caught up, it'll be a different story. But while we're here, God has got everything under control because we're still here. Woo! Woo! Hey! Shatarabu! Let's praise him. I feel something in here right now. Come on, lift your hands. Let's praise him. Woo! My God. Stand up just a minute. How? Come on, church. Woo. Yes, Lord. The immutability of the Word of God. One of the first things you wanna do when things get out of control is you don't wanna play a preacher's sermon. You wanna to go to the Word of God. Good sermons are good. Worship music is good. But when you're going through hell, you wanna reach for this right here. This, oh, come on. This book will speak to you. I said this book will speak to you. It is a talking book. It will talk to you. It's a speaking book. It will speak. When you can't get any kind of direction from anywhere else that brings you peace, open up this word. It is the immutable word of God. It cannot be. The word of God cannot be overruled. It is immutable. Which means it overrules chaos. It brings stability. So the first anchor you want to throw out is the anchor that when the boat is pulling along in the water and there's nothing to stop it and you're headed for the rocks, you throw this big rock, you throw this big anchor overboard and the hook of that anchor catches on a stone and it's called the Word of God. <laughs> it's called the Word of God. It grabs it. That anchor grabs that rock. It grabs that part of that rock is in the ocean bed and part of it is sticking up in the water. And when that anchor comes by, it grabs it and it pulls the front end of that boat around. And the mariners say, wow, thank God. That's the way it is when things start getting out of hand. Cast your anchor overboard and say, God, above all, I trust your word. And the Bible said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. Woo! <laughs> I remember one time I was fasting in Georgia years ago when I pastored in Warner Robins. I went there in 1973 and I pastored there through 79. So it was probably about 75. I was fasting. I was 24, 25 years old. And I was going through something. I don't remember what it was now. It is something how when you're going through something, you feel like, oh my God. And after it's over, you can't remember the details. So anybody that's going through something right now, probably five years from now, you can't hardly remember it anyway. So just rejoice. But I remember I was unlocking the side door under the garage. Me and Brenda had been somewhere. I was going in the house and I heard the Lord say to me, I heard him say it 
I don't know how I heard him say it. It was not in my ear, but it was so strong. He gave me a scripture verse to go turn to. I, I left the keys in the door. It was that strong. Went right back and got my Bible, opened up my Bible, and God made me five promises in one scripture. And I was going through a very dark time and he made me five promises. And I, I'm not even gonna go through the scripture. I don't wanna give you that, but <clears throat> none of those things was in motion in my life at that time. And some of those things didn't manifest in my life until I pastored Brownsville and revival came to Brownsville. And then one by one, those promises God gave me in 75 was now manifesting in 95, 20 years later. Yeah. <clears throat> you know what that says to me? God knew I was gonna be alive 20 years later. Right. I'm here to tell you that the devil may tell you he's gonna kill you. The devil may tell you you're not gonna be around to see your kids raised. You're not gonna be around to see your grandkids. The devil will tell you you're not gonna be around for this side or the other. But I just wanna remind you today of what God's promised you. His promises are yea and amen. And God is not one to lie. God will not lie. And if he told you, he's gonna do something. And he spoke to you through his word. It's as good as done right now. Come on, give him praise today. <clears throat> So whenever things begin to go wrong, you ain't got time to listen to a sermon. How many of you knows when things go wrong, you just got just sometimes seconds. Even if you say, Jesus, that anchor catches right there. I mean, that anchor just catches right there. It grabs hold and you feel the boat jerk. And what you say is, you remember that old song? My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. I would sing to you, but you're not enjoying it, I can tell. <laughs> you don't want someone's thoughts. When things are blowing out of control, you're gonna cast that anchor and it's gonna be the word of God and that's gonna grip and it's gonna hold. Nothing will hold you like the word of God. Second, the second anchor that you throw out is you want to lay hold of God's mercy. I told you this some time ago, some years ago, but God began to deal with me. <clears throat> I've been around a long time. I preached a lot of messages. I have heard a lot of messages. I've heard a lot of good preaching in my time and I'm not criticizing any of it because I love every preacher and I love their messages. But I heard such teaching on faith that many times I heard those teachings on faith and I left and walked away feeling like my faith wasn't as strong as their faith was. And I felt like that my faith was <clears throat> It was something that I was struggling with because I wanted to be greater and I wanted to see greater things and I just didn't feel like I was quite there yet. And I didn't know when I'd get there. And so I struggled with some of that stuff. Just being honest with you, bearing my heart to you. But then the Holy Spirit began to take me on a journey in the scriptures and he began to show me <clears throat> that it's impossible to please God without faith. Would you say that with me? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Say it with me. So I'm not minimizing faith. I believe in faith and I do have faith and I feel like my faith is strong and stalwart. I do feel that way. And I, I believe you feel the same way about your faith. But I, when I saw this revelation, I stopped operating all the time in faith and I began to call on God for his mercy. And I looked up mercy. It's an act of divine favor 
our compassion. Mercy is compassionate treatment for those in distress. Mercy is forbearance of punishment even when justice demands it. Mercy is extending help even to the lowliest and most undeserving. Mercy is goodwill from God towards you. It is his willingness to grant favors and it is an extended hand to the undeserving. When I read that about mercy, I don't know there was something about it that warmed me on the inside. Whereas before, when I was operating in faith, I felt like it it had to do with me. And whenever I faced something big, I was always gauging, is my faith strong enough for this? And most of the time, I didn't feel like it was. But I trusted God anyhow. But when God showed me that about mercy, that really changed my life. And so I had something come up right after that that was a big deal and it was a serious deal. And I just got through preaching on mercy. So I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, I said, I'm not going to go through this faith calisthenics with you. I said, I'm just going to appeal to your mercy. And I'm going to ask you to have mercy on me in this situation. It changed just that quick. Changed just like that. And it had to do with a situation that could have really gone against me, although I didn't do anything, could have really went against me. It was something that happened that I did not have my hand to, but it's something that happened that it fell in my lap. And so if I tried to jack my faith up, like jacking a car up, to get my faith, I didn't have time for that. Amen. Amen. And then a lot of times whenever you're facing something and you're trying to gauge and calibrate your faith to see, is this going to meet this major? You don't have time for that. And so I just appeal to God's mercy. And I'm telling you, this thing resolved itself like somebody took a hot iron to a wrinkled shirt. It just ironed it right out. And then I began to go to the scriptures. And then I began to see where blind Bartimaeus appealed to Jesus and he cried out and he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Here's a blind man that got healed from blindness by asking for mercy. He didn't say, Jesus, I've got great faith. I believe you can heal me. You know what he said? Jesus, have mercy on me. I'm in a situation I can't help myself. Lord, would you please have mercy on me? And Jesus said, look, great is your. Your faith has made you whole, but he appealed to God's mercy. See, sometimes I think that we sort of get a little bit of arrogant and we're sort of trying to impress Jesus. Stop trying to impress Jesus. Let Jesus impress you. Amen. And then the Bible said a woman of Canaan, you know, God led the children of Israel into Canaan. It said a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and she cried and she said, have mercy on me, Lord. Thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So the Lord brought the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Now they're in the land of Canaan. Jesus is in the land of Canaan. He promised it to Abraham. He promised it to Moses. Now Jesus is in the land of Canaan. Here comes this woman, a heathen. She's not even a Jew. Have mercy on me. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And she said, have mercy. You know what the Lord did? He healed her daughter. Not because she had such impressive faith that he said, oh my God, I've never seen such faith. No, she reached out and laid hold of his mercy and God gave her a miracle. One last thing, this man in the Bible, 
when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic and sore vexed and oftentimes he falls into the fire and oftentimes in the water. And you know what Jesus did? He cast the devils out of that boy, not because of the man's faith, but because of the man's appeal to his mercy. Isn't it strange that in the Browns revival, every night the song was sung, Mercy Seat. Mercy Seat was sang every night in the revival. I can still see her standing there with a the little long hair. When I first heard her, she was a little teenage girl. I think she's 14. And somebody wanted me and Lyndall to go around there and hear this girl sing. So I said, Lyndall, you want to go around there? He said, ah, right, let's go. We walked around there and she sort of sang for us a few bars. And she opened up that little mouth of hers and she sang that song, Mercy Seat. And we said, you're in. <laughs> and she sang every night of the Brownsville Revival, Mercy Seat. What did God do in the revival? It wasn't, how great is thy faith? It was mercy seat. You know what people can relate to? People can relate to God, appealing to God's mercy. Sometimes you can't impress God so much by your faith as you impress him by saying, I need your mercy, Lord. So when you throw out an anchor, the first one is the immutability of God's word. Let it grab hold of that rock and it'll swing that boat around, and then you wanna throw out an anchor in the back, and you're gonna throw out an anchor called the mercy of God. And that anchor will grab hold of the mercy of God, and it holds fast. You don't have time to adjust your faith. You don't have time to lick your lips and go read some scripture and listen to some tapes and say, oh, I feel my faith rising. No, you're appealing to God and saying, I'm unworthy. I don't really deserve this, Lord, but I appeal to your mercy. Help, help. We're gonna drown. I appeal to your mercy. And Jesus helped them. And I just wanna to say to you right now, there's some of you and some of you watching me by television. Just go ahead and appeal to God's mercy. Some of you has been bound the same way I was bound and I'm making myself vulnerable to you as a preacher. And I'm telling you back during that era of a lot of faith preaching, I loved it and I still love it and I still listen to some of it sometime. But most of the time I never felt like my faith was quite up to par of most people that I knew. And I did have great faith, I had good faith. It was strong faith. But when I learned to cry out to God for his mercy, it changed my life. Let's talk about the third anchor. Anchor number three is the anchor of the presence of God. Somebody shout amen. amen. Cast your anchor in the stormy waters and feel that anchor drag until it hits that rock of the presence of God. Moses said to God, I'm not gonna go unless your presence goes with us. Moses was the most powerful man that ever lived beside Christ. He was a powerful man. He was brilliant. Raised in Egypt, in the universities, trained and bred in the universities of Egypt, raised in Pharaoh's household. He was brilliant. Something else. God laid his hand on him. But even in spite of being raised in Pharaoh's household and in spite of being so brilliant in, in the colleges and universities, the, the most important thing to him was the presence. You know, I remember in Brownsville, you name it, they came. They came. In Brownsville, we had doctors, we had lawyers, we had garbage collectors. We had senators, we had ambassadors from other nations, we had Congress people. We had all kinds of people come to Brownsville. We even had one guy one night, very well known, I won't call his name, if I called his name, you'd know him. 
He said, I want to come. I've been hearing about the revival. He said, but maybe you can let me in the back door where I can go in the TV department so nobody will see me. Nobody will know me. Because if I walk in, I'm going to get everybody's attention and I don't want to do that. I just want to receive. So he went in our TV department and he watched the program. And when the Holy Spirit began to come down, tears began to run down his face. You see, there is something that transcends the dimension of the natural. <clears throat> I said there is something that transcends the dimension of normal things and the natural things. And when you get in the presence of God, oh, the glory of God, I can feel it while I talk about it. When you get in that presence of God, people came from all over the world. They didn't come because of Steve's preaching. They didn't come because of Lindell's singing. It was both good. That was excellent. Both of them were excellent. They sure didn't come because of me. I know that beyond any doubt. Why did they come? The presence of God. The glory and the presence of God. And listen, if I'm in a storm, if all hell is coming against me and everything's breaking loose, I want three things so far. I want the word. I want to appeal to God's mercy and I want him to let me know he's with me. He's with me. Fear not, for I am with you, saith the Lord. And the name Emmanuel means God with us. Isaiah 43, one through three says, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when you walk through the fire, you won't be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. What he was saying through the eloquent prophet. Israel had a lot of prophets. Isaiah was Israel's most eloquent prophet. Elijah was Israel's most powerful prophet. But Isaiah was Israel's most eloquent prophet. When you read his writings, there's an eloquence to it. There's a statesmanship that's hidden in the pages of his prophecy. And he wrote some of the most profound words about God and about his presence. Look at this one more time. Look what it says, just exactly what these mariners were going through. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you go through the rivers, they'll not overflow you, you won't drown. And when you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego about that. The Bible says when they came out, they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Take just a minute with me here. And let's lift up our hands and say, Lord, thank you for the anchor of your presence in my life. Come on, just lift your voice for a moment. Thank you, Lord. You've been so good, Lord, to be with us and to keep us. As we go through the things, Lord, that we go through, you have kept us. Your presence has secured us and has brought us safely through. Finally, the last anchor that I want to talk about is the anchor of God's sovereignty. The anchor of God's sovereignty. That's the fourth anchor. I looked up the word sovereign and it means absolute control. When you read the Bible and it talks about the sovereignty of God, it's saying that God is in absolute control. Supreme authority, freedom from any external control, nothing has control over him, nothing and no one has control over God. He is the final word. Undisputed, totally autonomous, paramount. In other words, what God's saying by being sovereign is, I know 
the end from the beginning. In other words, before the gun ever fires and you start the race, I've already seen the end. And can I say something to you right now? God has already seen everything that you're headed toward and he's already made a way of your escape. God has already seen the end. But see, what, what the problem is, and, and listen, this is the honest truth. What the problem is, God has already got a chart prepared for you, and it's a good chart. It's good thinking, and it's a good end. But you have to be careful that you don't devise your own way. Because if you devise your own way, you can get off course and wind up shipwrecked, but God won't have a thing to do with it. It's because you didn't follow him and stay in his will. You, you didn't stay in his will. So when he says, I've already seen your end from your beginning, he didn't see some of those things that would trouble you and cause you to fear. He's already seen the end from the beginning. And he's saying, everything is father filtered. Let me tell you about that. I don't care what it is. Now, you may want to challenge this statement, but I'm ready for you. <laughs> I don't care what it is, but everything that comes your way is father filtered. Everything. So, when these things come, don't be surprised. For some reason, beyond our own knowledge, it was permitted. It was father filtered. I went to my first church in Georgia, 1970. 1970. That was in the plan of God. That was father filtered. Second church, Georgia, nine, six years there, father filtered. Indiana, three years, Father Filter. Brownsville, 22 and a half years, Father Filtered. Church of His Presence, almost 17 years now, Father Filtered. Everything that has come my way has been Father Filtered. It's been permitted. The good and the not so good. But you know what? I'm still standing. And I want to say the same thing about you. You're still standing too. You may have some holes in you. You may have some scars on you. You may have a few hairs less where you pulled it out, but you're still here. God has brought you through everything that he's brought you through. Why? Because everything is father filtered. Come on, give him praise. Listen to this. Paul's on board this boat. Ah, brother, and he said, I don't know. I, I just feel, I perceive something's not right. Here's Paul on the boat. And you know how it all wound up? The boat broke all two pieces. Not a soul was lost. And they all came floating to shore on pieces of the boat. Not on life jackets, but on pieces of the boat that broke all to pieces. Now you might say, well, why did God do that. How come he didn't send the angel to take Paul up under his wings and bring him to shore? Everything's father filtered. When he told him how it was going to end, he's saying, this is going to be something that's going to be a little uncomfortable, but you're going to be fine. You're going to stand before Caesar. But in the meantime, there's going to be some uncomfortable days. And Paul, you've got to stand before Caesar but be ready for some uncomfortable situations, but everything's gonna be okay. It's father filtered. And you know what? There's some of the things that you're going through right now that you wish that the Lord would just send an angel and bail you out. Well, if you get bailed out, he's gonna stop things where they are right now. He's gonna stop the clock right now, but he may deliver you and you say, I can't take it anymore, but he'll bring you back to it later and you're gonna to have to finish it out one way or the other. He may stop the clock, and he may evacuate you somewhere, but later he's gonna come back and say, now you gotta finish this, son. He's not gonna take you out of everything that's uncomfortable. 
He's not going to take you out of every storm. He's on the boat with the disciples and this wind comes up and the disciples goes down and wakes him up. Oh, don't you care that we perish? And what Jesus was basically saying is, this was Father filtered. You gonna be okay? He told him before they got in the boat, we're going to the other side. That was the anchor of the immutability of God's word. We're going to the other side. And listen, we're gonna to have to get to the place that every one of us comes to the realization, you're going to the other side. It doesn't make any difference what anybody says. It doesn't make any difference what the devil does. Let the heathen rage, you're gonna be okay. I said you're gonna be okay. God is gonna bring you through. <laughs> Come on, give God praise. I feel that today. Let me show these four anchors one more time. The first anchor is the immutability of God's word. That's the first anchor that you throw out. The second anchor is laying hold of God's mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. The third anchor that you throw out to stabilize your life is you ask God, I ask that you go with me. I need your presence with me. The fourth anchor is the anchor of God's sovereignty. He has everything under control. Everything is Father filtered. I mean everything. So you might say, or oh, Brother Kilpatrick, you reckon how much longer I've got to live? Why would you let that bother you? Because if you look back, he's took care of you in the past, he's gonna take care of your future the same way. I said, God has took care of everything in the past and he's gonna take care of everything in the future. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says, if you do certain thing, I'm gonna bail out on you, I'm gonna leave you on your own. It never says that. He's gonna be with you to the very end. <laughs> 